It's good to be back with you this evening. Uh, yes, we are out of Genesis. I likely will not spend as much time um, through any of the other books. Uh, we would not be able to, to cover them all, but I definitely don't want to speed through the book of Exodus either. It obviously is a, a critical uh, book in the Pentateuch, and uh, we have much to glean from it. To get us uh, into the material, I'd like to read just a few verses from chapter 3 and then uh, one verse from chapter 6 of Exodus. So Exodus chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. So this is when uh, Moses has his great encounter with Yahweh God at the burning bush. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. And then a few chapters ahead to chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. And as you likely know, capital L-O-R-D is the name Yahweh. Some uh, pronounce it Jehovah. I am Yahweh. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, or El Shaddai. But by my name, Yahweh, I was not known to them. So what is the big theme of Exodus. I'm going to be thinking with you tonight specifically about what I refer to as the Exodus proper, that is Exodus chapters 1 through 15. Uh, This is a fairly complete unit. It's basically God's delivering his people out of Egypt, and then it ends in chapter 15 with the great song of praise to God. And then after that song, uh, we head toward Mount Sinai for the covenant and the law, and then the tabernacle occupies uh, the last third of the book of Exodus. But the Exodus proper, that is the deliverance, is chapters 1 through 15, and that's what I want to consider with you this evening. I think if we asked a variety of people what is the Exodus about, a lot of them would probably say something to the effect of it's God delivering his people out of slavery. Um, The theme of freedom is there, the theme of liberty, and certainly that uh, is one of the themes that we see in this book. Nevertheless, I would suggest to you that there is actually a a greater overarching theme that um, uh, the idea of liberty and freedom feeds into as a sub-theme. And the greater overarching theme, the umbrella theme for these chapters, Exodus 1 through 15, would be, uh, I would suggest, the knowledge of Yahweh or knowing the Lord. And uh, in a moment, I want to just basically with you work through some of these texts to show you this for yourself. And and Lord willing, you'll be able to see uh, very clearly how this is the dominant theme, the dominant idea, the dominant purpose of God for this deliverance of Israel. But before we even jump into that, we do actually have to scoop backward into the book of Genesis very briefly uh, because... One of the things that we need to appreciate about the need for the theme of knowing the Lord is how the book of Genesis sets up that need. So there's really a twofold problem that um, occurs throughout the book of Genesis. And the first one is a growing distance between God and humanity. So think about the book of Genesis. It begins with humanity with God in the paradise of Eden. And how does Genesis end? Genesis ends very somberly. Verse 26 of Genesis 50, Joseph died. It ends with death, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him. He was put in a coffin in Egypt. You have this three-step staccato getting lower and lower and lower. He died, they embalmed him, put him in a coffin in Egypt. Egypt is like a spiritual Sheol. 
Uh, so we have this trajectory of life with God uh, to death in Egypt, from paradise to Egypt. And then think about all the stages of Genesis along the way. So Adam and Eve are exiled from God's presence. They're separated from God. And then we find in the Cain and Abel story that it ends up with Cain being exiled further east of Eden. And there's this trajectory that goes further and further away from God until the flood story where God judges all mankind except for Noah and his household, um, submerging them in the waters of the flood. And then as we saw our first evening together, we go from there to the Tower of Babel. And what's that story about? All the nations are in exile away from God. And so we have this, grow, this trajectory of growing distance between God and humanity. And even in the patriarchs, we, we sort of notice this trend as well. So Abraham has infrequent visitations from the Lord. But then we get to Jacob, and he has less frequent visitations from the Lord. And most of these are by way of dreams and visions. And then by the time we get to Joseph and his brothers, uh, we basically don't see God appearing at all. We know he's maneuvering everything by his providence. Uh, Joseph has a pair of dreams. Uh, so we see this growing distance from God also even geographically. Abraham is brought to the land. Uh, Jacob wanders out, returns, but then Jacob with the sons and their families end up in Egypt. And so part of the story of Genesis is a growing distance from God. Now what's key for us is to understand that you cannot separate the presence of God from the knowledge of God. And that's the second of this twofold problem. So a growing distance between God and humanity, but then also what we can describe as a growing ignorance of God on the part of humanity. Um, even God's people are in Egypt some 400 years. We have no um, witness about a prophet being raised up or anything like that. And we find out later on that they are steeped in idolatry um, in Egypt. And so what is going on through human history is that there is a growing, deepening darkness of ignorance of God. And this isn't an innocent ignorance. This is what Paul describes in Romans as a suppressing the truth of God in unrighteousness so that all the nations, by the time of the Exodus, all the nations are steeped in idolatry, in sexual immorality, in violence. And so you have this great twofold problem that is pervasive throughout the planet. There's distance from God, there's an absence of God's presence, a separation from God on the one hand, and then that has led to uh, a gross ignorance of God where the understanding of humanity has been darkened after suppressing the truth. And again, this even to some extent relates to God's own people there in Egypt. So part of the challenge for God, and of course there is no true challenge for God, but he is going to, by his divine wisdom, orchestrate the exodus so as to remedy this twofold problem. And so what we see is that the first half of Exodus, what I'm calling Exodus proper, chapters 1 through 15, God is going to overcome the ignorance of himself by humanity by revealing his glory, his name. And so again, this feeds into the idea that the, the great goal of the Exodus, the great theme of the Exodus, is the knowledge of Yahweh. And then what happens in the second half of the book of Exodus? You could probably guess where I'm going. Uh, the other part of the problem is that there is a distance from God. And what does God give to his people by way of covenant? He gives them the tabernacle so that the first time in human history since the Garden of Eden... God is dwelling among humanity. And so uh, the book of Exodus uh, is devised by God. Uh, the, the, um, the redemption of God is planned by God to overcome this great twofold problem. Where humanity is separated from God, he's going to give them himself through the tabernacle. But then also humanity is very ignorant of God and he's going to reveal his glory through the Exodus. And you can see why... Uh, Lord willing, you can see why we reverse uh, these two issues. Growing distance from God leads to ignorance, but God must first overcome that ignorance. We must know God before we are ushered into his presence. And so that's how the book of Exodus really relates uh, to Genesis. And having said that, I, I want to just again go through um, some of these sections in Exodus. Exodus. 
So first of all, we have uh, what I would call the, the introductory chapters, one through six, and this is where God calls uh, Moses to be the leader of his people to lead them in this great redemption. And once we understand what the main theme is, then everything should start fitting into place. You know, scholars refer to, and theologians, Exodus 3 is the Holy of Holies of Scripture. Why? Because that's where Yahweh confronts Moses, the burning bush. Uh, Moses removes his sandals, bows before him, and God reveals his name. This is the great self-revelation of God. So before God sends Moses to his people, he must reveal himself to Moses in a deep and significant way. Now, the other tip-off, uh, part of what I read, uh, surely it's... Um, very telling that when God says, Moses, I'm going to send you, I'm the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm going to send you to the Israelites, tell them that I've sent you, you're, you're going to release them, they're going to worship me, etc. Moses has this very interesting question. All right, when I tell them the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? That's a telling question. Um, but then another question, Moses says, what do I tell them? <laughs> Moses doesn't know what to tell them. You know, this would be like if, um, you know, you have nursery care um, during the morning service and, you know, one of the parents goes to a friend, um, you know, I, I need to go get this. Can you go get my child? And, you know, maybe you have the, the little um, plaque or whatever it is that nurseries give to parents to pick up children, you know, with the number on it and the number of their child. And just go tell little Susie uh, that daddy sent for her. Well, Susie says, what's his name? <laughs> um, that's very, that would be very odd, very puzzling. And this is what Moses is saying. I'm going to tell them that the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent me. What do I say when they ask me what his name is? So this is part of the theme of the ignorance of God. Uh, this also gets into the passage that I read in chapter 6, where God says, I was known to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as El Shaddai, but by my name, Yahweh, they didn't know me. Um, there's various ways that we can approach this issue because we see in Genesis that Abraham will declare the name Yahweh. Uh, that could be an anachronism, uh, just like we might say this Civil War battle was fought by the Circle K. Um, well, where the Circle K is now, but it wasn't there during the Civil War. It could be uh, Moses as an author. He knows that we know it's Yahweh. Nevertheless, I prefer the other way to think about this and was that perhaps Abraham did know the title. But what God is saying, he didn't understand the significance of the name Yahweh. And to understand the significance of the name, we don't just go to the root, I am who I am, or I will be who I'll be. But I think what God is basically saying is the name Yahweh or Jehovah is filled in by the deliverance out of Egypt. This is who he is. He is the God of the Exodus. And so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, though they had foreshadowings of the Exodus in their life, this great demonstration of the glory of God had not yet been revealed. So later on, when the prophets say there's going to be a new exodus, they'll, they'll say, you will not swear anymore by Yahweh who brought up the Israelites out of Egypt, but by Yahweh who performed the new exodus. This is what his name means. And so that's the introductory chapters. We can see how the theme sort of gets on the radar. Uh, but then we can go further than this. And one good way to... Uh, understand what the narrative is about is to go to the first uh, encounter between Moses and Pharaoh, and that's chapter 5. I'll read for us the first few verses. Read Exodus chapter 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? Again, capital letters. Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh, nor will I let Israel go. So through Pharaoh, we're being told that this whole um, deliverance, this whole battle between the Lord and Pharaoh is all about the knowledge of the Lord. In fact, Pharaoh himself makes that the test. 
because I don't know who Yahweh is, I will not let Israel go. You're telling me Yahweh commands me to let them go. I don't know who he is. And because I don't know who he is, I will not let them go. And we can invert that and say, well, when you find out who Yahweh is, then you will let Israel go. And so that's going to color the rest of the story now within this specific perspective that as Pharaoh and the Egyptians and even the Israelites, as we'll see, come to know who Yahweh is, that's what's going to lead to the release of the Israelites. What a bold word on the part of Pharaoh. Talk about putting a bullseye on your forehead. God says, oh, you want to get to know me. All right, let me introduce myself. And that brings us into the next major section of the Exodus, chapter 7 through 10, what we refer to as the plagues cycle or uh, the signs and wonders. And I want to just survey through some of these things, some of these signs and wonders, so you can see that most of them will have a very explicit purpose statement where God is saying, I'm going to do this sign in order that you may know that I am the Lord. God was listening and he wants to keep underscoring uh, that point for Pharaoh. And so let's look at some examples. Uh, chapter 7, verse 5. So we read, And the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So that's a very uh, summary statement. This includes everything God is about to do with all the signs and wonders, all the plagues. He's saying, when I stretch out my hand and it results in bringing them out, they will know. A uh, little bit further down that same chapter in verse 17. So this takes us to the first plague or the first sign and wonder where the water of the Nile is turned to blood. And we read in verse 17, Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am Yahweh. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. And we can just keep tracking down chapter 7 through 10. Maybe uh, just one more example for right now, chapter 8 and verse 10. So we read there, this is for the second plague of the frogs. And the context for this is Pharaoh's had enough of the frogs. He says, okay, okay, pray to, pray to you know, your God, get rid of these things. And Moses comes back and says, you tell me when you want me to pray. I don't want there to be any doubt that this is the Lord. This isn't going to happen by accident. And so Pharaoh responds um, by saying, tomorrow, and he said, Moses says to him, let it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like Yahweh our God. Hold on to that language. There is no one like Yahweh our God. We will come back to that. And again, there's other examples throughout the plagues into chapter 9, chapter 10. I'll give us a few more in a moment. But already I want to step back uh, with you and just ask. So part of the goal of the Lord is to reveal himself to the nations, ultimately, um, more narrowly to the Egyptians and more narrowly than that to his own people who need to know who he is. He's giving them the name Yahweh to call upon him in worship. He's about to give them the Ten Commandments, which includes not taking this great name in vain, but using it for the worship of the Lord. And they need to know the substance of this name. What could we say is being revealed through the Exodus story as you and I know it, all of these signs and wonders, these plagues, etc. cetera? Um, and there's two basic points I want to give you now when we're back together in a few weeks. There's a third major one, uh, a big piece of the puzzle I need to fill in, but we will skip it for now. But the first aspect I want to draw your attention to is that of creation theology. So note that all of these plagues or signs and wonders have to do with creation. God is demonstrating that he is the maker of heaven and earth. He is able to manipulate creation to do whatever he wants to be done, whether it's controlling the waters, whether it's bringing an east wind with the locusts, whether it's uh, the frogs or the lice, the flies, uh, the disease on the cattle. Ultimately, he's the God over life and death, as we will see when we get into Passover in a few weeks with the death of the firstborn. And so 
He is the God of all creation. And this is fundamental to our theology. This is in many ways the bedrock of our theology. The one who is outside creation, who created the heavens and the earth, and has the power to sustain creation, to control all creation, and to break in whenever he wants to, and manipulate the laws of creation for his own purposes, he is the one true God. And one way that uh, I think is intended as we read through this story is to see that while God's people are being recreated, so uh, when we get to the, the parting of the sea, it's a lot like the creation account. The seas are split, dry land appears, God's people walk on dry land, they are a new creation. This is the birth of the nation of Israel. But what about for the Egyptians? They are steadily being decreated. So their world is going from order and form to chaos. Remember how, what the condition of the earth was before God began his acts of separation. So Genesis 1-2, we read that the earth was covered over by the deep and shrouded in darkness. That is God's judgment often decreates. We have the same thing with the flood narrative, right? So the world in Genesis 6 to 9, returns to Genesis 1, 2, covered in waters. And what does God do when he remembers Noah? The creation account begins. He sends his wind, his spirit, and the waters are divided, dry land appears, and Noah and his household enter into a new creation. So while Israel is being brought into a new creation, what happens to Egypt? Well, isn't it fascinating that the climactic event of the Exodus after their whole world has been turned to chaos, water turning into blood, etc., the Egyptians end up just like Genesis 1-2, just like the wicked generation of Noah. They end up submerged in the sea. And if we read that the whole story is leading to that point, then we see that, yes, by this creation theology, we see that God is bringing judgment. He is bringing their own world into collapse so that they end up submerged in the seas of the deep while his own people are brought through as a new creation. So that's the first aspect of revelation that we can say God published his glory. I mean, the, the world at this point is filled with thousands upon thousands of gods, even within Egypt itself, much less the other nations. And God is here establishing the foundation for um, a life built on the worship, the fear of the Lord. And that is to know without all, any question, he is the maker of heaven and earth. Secondly, and it's a deduction from this, is that God is also establishing his supremacy over the gods of Egypt, who we know are no gods at all, but nevertheless, uh, these are idols that are being worshiped and God is establishing himself as the king above the gods. Now, how do we get there? Well, the first thing to acknowledge is simply that the Egyptians had a deity linked to every aspect of nature. And so there was a God of the Nile. And when God demonstrated his own power over the Nile, he was asserting his sovereignty over their God. Uh, another example is um, the God of the Nile was happy. But another example is that the Egyptians worshiped a God called Heket. It was a goddess who was pictured as a frog. And so scholars are able with every single sign and wonder that God displays is to link an Egyptian deity to it and uh, demonstrate to the Egyptians that this God who is the maker of heaven and earth, he is the king above all the gods. Everyone that you worship, whether it's uh, the cow God or the, whatever God it is, God demonstrates that he alone is supreme, the great king, as Moses told Pharaoh, that you'll know no one is like Yahweh. And we have uh, an explicit reference to this in Exodus 12 with the Passover, which again, we will look at more um, deliberately when we're together again the next time. But in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, the Lord says, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. And almost word for word, that is repeated in Numbers 33, 4, when it's talking about the Exodus. 
The Exodus deliverance of Israel was an execution of judgment upon all the gods of Egypt. And so throughout these mighty acts, God demonstrates himself to be, number one, maker of heaven and earth, number two, king above all the gods. Now, still stepping back before we jump into the flow of the story, uh, one of the things I pointed out uh, in previous weeks is the benefit of getting the major theme down. It helps to organize and prioritize all of the sub-themes and even to explain some difficult passages. Now, for us as uh, those who embrace Reformed theology, we understand God's sovereignty, although it's a lesson that we always uh, need to keep learning and to be humbled by. Nevertheless, this may not be a problem passage for us, but it's still a sub-theme that we need to align with the major theme, and I'm thinking of specifically the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Um, if we had decided that our major theme was the liberation of God's people or the freedom of the Israelites, then that theme of hardening Pharaoh's heart would not make any sense. Because if God's goal is to liberate his people, then what would he do with Pharaoh's heart? He'd soften it. I mean, God could have immediately made Pharaoh favorable towards his people like he did uh, centuries later with Cyrus and with other kings, and they would have simply released his people. And if you would have asked, you know, the number one prayer request in the prayer service in Egypt of the Israelites, it would have been harsh taskmasters were being abused, where slaves were, were, were being worked to death. We need to be liberated. These people were suffering and it was only getting worse and worse. And yet what we, we come to see is that God's priority wasn't first and foremost the release of his people. And I'll come back to that in a moment. He loves his people. He tells Moses, I've heard their cry. I care about them. I'm sending you to release them. But there was something greater, and this was to reveal his own glory for the sake of the nations, including his people. And what he's doing then with Pharaoh is he's hardening his heart. He's hardening him in his own um, rebellion against the Lord but for the sake of his being able to reveal himself in an even greater way. In other words, um, God has to hold up Pharaoh so that he can go 10 rounds, so that God can show some of his muscles, some of his moves, some of his might. Because otherwise, it would have been a three-second knockout. And God is saying, no, I'm going to sturdy him up. In fact, the actual word in Hebrew is, is to strengthen he is strengthening Pharaoh to prop him up so that God can display these things for the sake of his people and the nations. Um, and this is how then this sub-theme feed, feeds into the major theme. God wants to flex his arm, but all he has to do is breathe and Pharaoh will melt. And so he has to strengthen his resolve so that God can display more and more of his wonders so that they understand this creation theology so that they understand he's the king above the gods. And we get this pretty explicitly uh, in chapter 9. So I mentioned there's other examples in chapter 9 and 10. Here's one of them. If you look at chapter 9 and verse 13, we read there, The Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and on your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth, as yet you exalt yourself against my people and that you will not let them go. So this is the passage you may recall is what, that Paul quotes in Romans 9 when he's talking about the sovereignty of God and he goes straight to Pharaoh and he says, God even said it to Pharaoh through Moses. I've raised you up for this purpose that through you I might show my glory and establish a name for myself. And remember how this relates to the Tower of Babel. Humanity is in a place where uh, they want to make a name for themselves. And here God is going to make a name for himself, but for the sake of the good of his people. Now let me return back to that thought of God's people suffering. Uh, 
because we experience this all the time and there's nothing like a prayer service to remind us that we are not yet in glory. God cares about his people. This is one of the things that is revealed by God through this deliverance, that he is faithful to his promises to the fathers, that he will deliver his people out of Egypt, their children out of Egypt, but also that he hears their cries and he cares. Nevertheless, when we are suffering uh, and we get frustrated and we ask the questions of God and we see that he doesn't answer us right away, we have stories like this to teach us. Um, as hard as it is for us to uh, appreciate and as hard as it was for the Israelites because they were in severe bondage, their immediate comfort uh, would have been very temporary and God had a greater plan in mind. There's a greater theme to the history of the world than the comforting of the Israelites at this point. And that greater purpose, uh, as I'm trying to convey, is the glory of God and publishing it but note that the glory of God is always, always for the good of his people. And this is something that comes out uh, in chapter 10. Uh, another example that I've saved for, for this um, particular point. In chapter 10, the first uh, few verses, the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants. Why? That I may show these signs of mine before him. We just covered that. But listen to verse 2. This is for the sake of Israel. And that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them that you may know I am Yahweh. God is saying, I'm not going to give you an immediate release of your anxieties and of your pain and of your suffering because I want to reveal a greater glory that will be for generations to bless not just you, but your children and your children's children that you may pass on to them the mighty acts that Yahweh accomplished in Egypt. And isn't that what we read about in all the Psalms? One generation will declare to the next generation so that we have a long covenantal line of people praising God and finding eternal life through the knowledge of him. And God says, uh, you will thank me later. You will trust me. But for now, trust my wisdom. The, there, the comfort is coming, but there's a greater good right now. And our own suffering is feeding into a greater ideal. I think there's, I think a real parallel passage to this that may seem odd at first is uh, the raising of Lazarus. You remember that the timing is a big part of that story. And what is, what is, what are Martha and Mary continually saying to Jesus? Master, if you would have come sooner, our brother would not have died. We know that Jesus loved him, but what was the goal of that story? The greater glory of God through this great work. But it's a God's glory for the good of his people is actually for the greater um, long-lasting comfort of Mary and Martha. Jesus was able to demonstrate that God not only has the power to keep from death, but the ultimate power that we rest all of our hope in. He has the power to raise up from death. So that when it was time for Lazarus after being raised up, years later, we don't know how long, to lay down on his sick bed and close his eyes in death. Imagine the comfort his sisters had then. God's already demonstrated the power of resurrection. And we can close our eyes. It's like Simeon because we've seen the salvation of God and fully trust ourselves to the God who raises from the dead. And he was doing the same thing with his people. It's a severe mercy, as C.S. Lewis called it, to allow them to continue um, in this suffering and in this grief for their own greater good, for the good even of their great-grandchildren. Now, uh, hurrying on then, what's the next big event after the plagues? Uh, Passover will be next time we're together, but it's the crossing through the sea. And let me just give you a few passages there that, that have the same purpose statement, the same agenda for the sea crossing. Exodus 14.4. And here we'll see how the sub-theme feeds into the major theme, the sub-theme of Pharaoh's hardened heart. So Exodus 14, verse 4, Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am Yahweh. And they did so. And then a few verses down, several verses down to verse 18, 
Then the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. So from beginning to end, the introduction to the story, Pharaoh's first encounter with Moses, the plague, signs and wonders, the sea crossing, God is continually saying, what I'm about is to publish my glory for the good of my people and for the good of the nations. That then leads us to the climactic pion of praise, the Song of Moses in Exodus 15. We don't have time to read through it, but essentially you have two halves. The first half is talking about God's mighty work through the sea deliverance, how his people walked through walls of death. The second half is looking forward to their being brought into the land, walking through walls of death as in the nations now. And they're saying just how God delivered us through the sea of death, he'll deliver us through the nations. And then right at the heart in the middle, uh, we get verse 11, where God's people led by Moses sing this, who is like you, O Yahweh, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You see, if God would have just turned Pharaoh's heart, released the Israelites, they wouldn't know who God is. They would not have been able to sing this song. And what kind of liberation is it if you cannot sing this, who is like you? This question is the counter to the heavenly declaration, holy, holy, holy. Because what does holiness mean? No one is like you. And this is what they're saying. Who is like you? It's a rhetorical question. They're saying, you are the king over all the gods. No one is like Yahweh, the maker of heaven and earth. And so he has published his name. He's brought his people to a knowledge of him. Now he's about to bring them into his presence. Well, let me just quickly um, demonstrate that um, God's agenda was successful. No surprise to us. But just think with me what we get after the Pentateuch in the book of Joshua. So here God's people are being led by Joshua into the land to conquer. The first great city is Jericho. And who do we find in Jericho that knows and has heard about the glory of Yahweh? But of all things, a Canaanite harlot. And she says in Joshua 2 verse 10, For we have heard how Yahweh, she uses his name, how Yahweh dried up the water of the sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And then in verse 11, she makes this great confession. Yahweh, your God, he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. So what did she learn about this Exodus deliverance? He's the maker of heaven and earth, and there is no God like him. And so as you know, uh, she ends up marrying someone in the line of Judah. We talked about him last time. And she becomes the ancestress of King David and also the ancestress of the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. This Canaanite harlot who heard about the glory of Yahweh because he allowed his people to endure suffering a little while longer as he held up Pharaoh so that he could go 10 rounds with him to reveal his glory and to publish his name. The glory of God is for the good of his people. And then let me just briefly say before I close in prayer, when the prophets prophesy a new exodus, it's the same agenda. Um, through the new exodus, Yahweh will so make himself known that they will all know me. No one will need to teach his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the greatest to the least of them. It's going to be a much greater exodus, the exodus of Jesus out of the grave after he suffered on the cross bearing our sins as an atonement. And so the Gospel of John, I think, has this theology in mind when it talks about Jesus being the one who exegetes and who reveals God, ultimately through the cross. The cross of Christ reveals the attributes of God in full harmony like no other event in history. He is the God of the new exodus. On the cross, we see his wrath, his justice, but we also see his loving kindness, his mercy, his love for sinners because it's his son on the cross bearing the brunt of our judgment in place. And so God designed our salvation to publish his glory. The same gospel where Jesus himself says, this is eternal life, that they may know you and the one whom you have sent. And so through Jesus Christ and his cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his name is being published throughout all the nations that they may know he's the maker of heaven and earth, the only savior uh, given unto men, the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is no God like our God.
And we, even here in this room, represent the many nations that have been ushered into the presence of the Father through the new and living way of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we have all the more reason to sing this song of Moses as we read all the saints will do in the book of Revelation, for he has delivered us in his wisdom in a way that has revealed himself like no other event through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you love us and you have ordained all things that come to pass that we can trust you with all of our concerns, knowing that you in your glory have our good in mind. And we thank you that we can be alive in these last days and look back to what you have accomplished through the Lord Jesus, that we have such a full and abundant revelation of you that we know you are gracious, you are merciful, that you are loving and yet also a God to be feared. And so we thank you that you have provided for our need through the cross of Christ and how we praise you for him. And we pray that him whom you have exalted to your right hand and given the name above every name, that his name would be published among the nations. We know when he is exalted, he will draw all people to himself. And so we pray that your spirit would accomplish that good work in our own days and even through the teaching ministry of the word here at Providence. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.